second part of Missing, page 13, by Anna Catherine Green. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. Missing, page 13, by Anna Catherine Green. Part 3 Miss Strange, thus appealed to, asked where the gentlemen were now. She was told that they were still all together in the library. The ladies had been sent home. "'Then let us go to them,' said Violet, hiding under a smile her great fear that here was an affair which might very easily spell for her that dismal word, failure. So great was that fear that under all ordinary circumstances she would have had no thought for anything else in the short interim between this stating of the problem and her speedy entrance among the persons involved. But the circumstances of this case were so far from ordinary, or rather, let me put it this way, the setting of the case was so very extraordinary that she scarcely thought of the problem before her, in her great interest in the house through whose rambling halls she was being so carefully guided. So much that was tragic and heart-rending had occurred here. The Van Brooklyn name, the Van Brooklyn history, above all the Van Brooklyn tradition, which made the house unique in the country's annals, all made an appeal to her imagination, and centered her thoughts on what she saw about her. There was a door which no man ever opened, had never opened since revolutionary times. Should she see it? Should she know it, if she did see it? Then Mr. Van Brooklyn himself, just to meet him under any conditions and in any place, was an event. But to meet him here, under the pall of his own mystery. No wonder she had no words for her companions, or that her thoughts clung to this anticipation in wonder and almost fearsome delight. His story was a well-known one. A bachelor and a misanthrope, he lived absolutely alone, save for a large entourage of servants, all men and elderly ones at that. He never visited, though he now and then, as on this occasion, entertained certain persons under his roof. He declined every invitation for himself, avoiding even, with equal strictness, all evening amusements of whatever kind which would detain him in the city after ten at night. Perhaps this was to ensure no break in his rule of life, never to sleep out of his own bed. Though he was a man well over fifty, he had not spent, according to his own statement, but two nights out of his own bed since his return from Europe in early boyhood, and those were in obedience to a judicial summons which took him to Boston. This was his main eccentricity, but he had another, which is apparent enough from what has already been said. He avoided women. If thrown in with them during his short visits into town, he was invariably polite and at all times companionable, but he never sought them out, nor had gossip, contrary to its usual habit, ever linked his name with one of the sex. Yet he was a man of more than ordinary attraction. His features were fine, and his figure impressive. He might have been the cynosure of all eyes had he chosen to enter crowded drawing-rooms, or even to frequent public assemblages. But having turned his back upon everything of the kind in his youth, he had found it impossible to alter his habits with advancing years. Nor was he now expected to. The position he had taken was respected. Leonard Van Brooklyn was no longer criticized. Was there any explanation for this strangely self-centered life? Those who knew him best seemed to think so. In the first place, he had sprung from an unfortunate stock. Events of an unusual and tragic nature had marked the family of both parents. Nor had his parents themselves been exempt from this seeming fatality. Antagonistic in tastes and temperament, they had dragged on an unhappy existence in the old home, till both natures rebelled, and a separation ensued, which not only disunited their lives, but sent them to opposite sides of the globe, never to return again. At least that was the inference drawn from the peculiar circumstances attending the event. 
on the morning of one never-to-be-forgotten day. John Van Brooklyn, the grandfather of the present representative of the family, found the following note from his son lying on the library table. Father, life in this house or any house with her is no longer endurable. One of us must go. The mother should not be separated from her child. Therefore, it is I whom you will never see again. Forget me, but be considerate of her and the boy. William. Six hours later, another note was found, this time from the wife. Father. Tied to a rotting corpse, what does one do? Lop off one's arm, if necessary, to rid one of the contact. As all love between your son and myself is dead, I can no longer live within the sound of his voice. As this is his home, he is the one to remain in it. May our child reap the benefit of his mother's loss and his father's affection. Rhoda. Both were gone and gone forever. Simultaneous in their departure, they preserved each his own silence and sent no word back. If the one went east and the other west, they may have met on the other side of the globe, but never again in the home which sheltered their boy. For him and for his grandfather, they had sunk from sight in the great sea of humanity, leaving them stranded on an isolated and mournful shore. The grandfather steeled himself to the double loss for the child's sake, but the boy of eleven succumbed. Few of the world's great sufferers, of whatever age or condition, have mourned as this child mourned, or shown the effects of his grief so deeply or so long. Not till he had passed his majority did the line, carved in one day in his baby forehead, lose any of its intensity. And there are those who declare that even later than that, the midnight stillness of the house was disturbed from time to time by his muffled shriek of, Mother! Mother! sending the servants from the house and adding one more horror to the many which clung about this accursed mansion. Of this cry Violet had heard, and it was that and the door, but I have already told you about the door which she was still looking for, when her two companions suddenly halted, and she found herself on the threshold of the library, in full view of Mr. Van Brooklyn and his two guests. Slight and fairy-like in figure, with an air of modest reserve more in keeping with her youth and dainty dimpling beauty than with her errand, her appearance produced an astonishment which none of the gentlemen were able to disguise. This the clever detective with a genius for social problems and odd elusive cases? This darling of the ballroom in satin and pearls? Mr. Spielhagen glanced at Mr. Cornell, and Mr. Cornell at Mr. Spielhagen and both at Mr. Upjohn, in very evident distrust. As for Violet, she had eyes only for Mr. Van Brooklyn, who stood before her in a surprise equal to that of the others, but with more restraint in its expression. She was not disappointed in him. She had expected to see a man reserved almost to the point of austerity, and she found his first look even more awe-compelling than her imagination had pictured, so much so, indeed, that her resolution faltered, and she took a quick step backward, which seeing, he smiled, and her heart and hopes grew warm again. That he could smile, and smile with absolute sweetness, was her great comfort when later, but I am introducing you too hurriedly to the catastrophe. There is much to be told first. I pass over the preliminaries, and come at once to the moment when Violet, having listened to a repetition of the full facts, stood with downcast eyes before these gentlemen, complaining in some alarm to herself. They expect me to tell them now, and without further search or parley, just where this missing page is. I shall have to balk that expectation without losing their confidence. But how? Summoning up her courage, and meeting each inquiring eye with a look which seemed to carry a different message to each, she remarked very quietly, This is not a matter to guess at. I must have time, and I must look a little deeper into the facts just given me. I presume that the table I see over there is the one upon which Mr. Upjohn laid the manuscript during Mr. Spielhagen's unconsciousness. All nodded. 
Is it, I mean the table, in the same condition it was then? Has nothing been taken from it except the manuscript? Nothing. Then the missing page is not there, she smiled, pointing to its bare top. A pause during which she stood with her gaze fixed on the floor before her. She was thinking, and thinking hard. Suddenly she came to a decision. Addressing Mr. Upjohn, she asked if he were quite sure that in taking the manuscript from Mr. Spielhagen's hand he had neither disarranged nor dropped one of its pages. The answer was unequivocal. Then, she declared with quiet assurance and a steady meeting with her own of every eye, as the thirteenth page was not found among the others when they were taken from this table, nor on the persons of either Mr. Cornell or Mr. Spielhagen, it is still in that inner room. Impossible, came from every lip, each in a different tone. That room is absolutely empty. May I have a look at its emptiness, she asked, with a naive glance at Mr. Van Brooklyn. There is positively nothing in the room but the chair Mr. Spielhagen sat on, objected that gentleman with a noticeable air of reluctance. Still, may I not have a look at it, she persisted, with that disarming smile she kept for great occasions. Mr. Van Brooklyn bowed. He could not refuse a request so urged, but his step was slow, and his manner next to ungracious as he led the way to the door of the adjoining room and threw it open. Just what she had been told to expect. Bare walls and floors and an empty chair. Yet she did not instantly withdraw, but stood silently contemplating the panelled wainscoting around her, as though she suspected it of containing some secret hiding place not apparent to the eye. Mr. Van Brooklyn, noting this, hastened to say, The walls are sound, Miss Strange. They contain no hidden cupboards. And that door, she asked, pointing to a portion of the wainscoting so exactly like the rest that only the most experienced eye could detect the line of deeper color which marked an opening. For an instant, Mr. Van Brooklyn stood rigid. Then the immovable pallor, which was one of his chief characteristics, gave way to a deep flush as he explained, There was a door there once, but it has been permanently closed. With cement, he forced himself to add, his countenance losing its evanescent color till it shone ghastly again in the strong light. With difficulty, Violet preserved her show of composure. The door, she murmured to herself, I have found it, the great historic door. But her tone was light as she ventured to say, Then it can no longer be opened by your hand or any other? It could not be opened with an axe. Violet sighed in the midst of her triumph. Her curiosity had been satisfied, but the problem she had been set to solve looked inexplicable. But she was not one to yield easily to discouragement. Marking the disappointment approaching to disdain in every eye but Mr. Upjohn's, she drew herself up, she had not far to draw, and made this final proposal. A sheet of paper, she remarked, of the size of this one cannot be spirited away or dissolved into thin air. It exists, it is here, and all we want is some happy thought in order to find it. I acknowledge that that happy thought has not come to me yet, but sometimes I get it in what may seem to you a very odd way. Forgetting myself, I try to assume the individuality of the person who has worked the mystery. If I can think with his thoughts, I possibly may follow him in his actions. In this case, I should like to make believe for a few moments that I am Mr. Spielhagen. With what a delicious smile she said this. I should like to hold his thesis in my hand and be interrupted in my reading by Mr. Cornell offering his glass of cordial. Then I should like to nod and slip off mentally into a deep sleep. Possibly in that sleep the dream may come which will clarify the whole situation. Will you humor me so far? A ridiculous concession, but finally she had her way. 
the farce was enacted, and they left her as she had requested them to do, alone with her dreams in the small room. Suddenly they heard her cry out, and in another moment she appeared before them, the picture of excitement. "'Is this chair standing exactly as it did when Mr. Spielhagen occupied it?' she asked. "'No,' said Mr. Upjohn. "'It faced the other way.' She stepped back and twirled the chair about with her disengaged hand. "'So?' Mr. Upjohn and Mr. Spielhagen both nodded. So did the others when she glanced at them. With a sign of ill-concealed satisfaction, she drew their attention to herself, then eagerly cried, "'Gentlemen, look here!' Seating herself, she allowed her whole body to relax till she presented the picture of one calmly asleep. Then, as they continued to gaze at her with fascinated eyes, not knowing what to expect, they saw something white escape from her lap and slide across the floor till it touched and was stayed by the wainscot. It was the top page of the manuscript she held, and as some inkling of the truth reached their astonished minds, she sprang impetuously to her feet, and pointing to the fallen sheet, cried, Do you understand now? Look where it lies, and then look here. She had bounded toward the wall, and was now on her knees pointing to the bottom of the wainscot, just a few inches to the left of the fallen page. A crack, she cried, under what was once the door, it's a very thin one, hardly perceptible to the eye, but see! Here she laid her finger on the fallen paper, and drawing it towards her, pushed it carefully against the lower edge of the wainscot. Half of it at once disappeared. I could easily slip it all through, she assured them, withdrawing the sheet and leaping to her feet in triumph. You know now where the missing page lies, Mr. Spielhagen. All that remains is for Mr. Van Brooklyn to get it for you. Part 4 The cries of mingled astonishment and relief which greeted this simple elucidation of the mystery were broken by a curiously choked, almost unintelligible cry. It came from the man thus appealed to, who, unnoticed by them all, had started at her first word, and gradually, as action followed action, withdrawn himself till he now stood alone and in an attitude almost of defiance behind the large table in the centre of the library. "'I am sorry,' he began, with a brusqueness which gradually toned down into a forced urbanity, as he beheld every eye fixed upon him in amazement." that circumstances forbid my being of assistance to you in this unfortunate matter. If the paper lies where you say, and I see no other explanation of its loss, I am afraid it will have to remain there for this night at least. The cement in which that door is embedded is thick as any wall. It would take men with pickaxes, possibly with dynamite, to make a breach there wide enough for anyone to reach in and we are far from any such help. In the midst of the consternation caused by these words, the clock on the mantel behind his back rang out the hour. It was but a double stroke, but that meant two hours after midnight, and had the effect of a knell in the hearts of those most interested. But I am expected to give that formula into the hands of our manager before six o'clock in the morning. The steamer sails at a quarter after. "'Can't you reproduce a copy of it from memory?' someone asked, "'and insert it in its proper place among the pages you hold there. "'The paper would not be the same. "'That would lead to questions and the truth would come out. "'As the chief value of the process contained in that formula lies in its secrecy, "'no explanation I could give would relieve me from the suspicions "'which an acknowledgment of the existence of a third copy, "'however well hidden, would entail.' I should lose my great opportunity. Mr. Cornell's state of mind can be imagined. In an access of mingled regret and despair, he cast a glance at Violet, who, with a nod of understanding, left the little room in which they stood and approached Mr. Van Brooklyn. Lifting up her head, for he was very tall, and instinctively rising on her toes the nearer to reach his ear, she asked in a cautious whisper, "'Is there no other way of reaching that place?' 
she acknowledged afterwards that for one moment her heart stood still from fear such a change took place in his face though she says he did not move a muscle then just when she was expecting from him some harsh or forbidding word he wheeled abruptly away from her and crossing to a window at his side lifted the shade and looked out when he returned he was his usual self so far as she could see there is a way he now confided to her in a tone as low as her own but it can only be taken by a child not by me she asked smiling down at her own childish proportions for an instant he seemed taken aback then she saw his hand begin to tremble and his lips twitch somehow she knew not why she began to pity him and asked herself as she felt rather than saw the struggle in his mind that here was a trouble which if once understood would greatly dwarf that of the two men in the room behind them i am discreet she whisperingly declared i have heard the history of that door how it was against the tradition of the family to have it opened there must have been some very dreadful reason but old superstitions do not affect me and if you will allow me to take the way you mention i will follow your bidding exactly and will not trouble myself about anything but the recovery of this paper which must lie only a little way inside that blocked up door was his look one of rebuke at her presumption or just the constrained expression of a perturbed mind probably the latter for while she watched him for some understanding of his mood he reached out his hand and touched one of the satin folds crossing her shoulder you would soil this irretrievably said he there is stuff in the stores for another she smiled slowly his touch deepened into pressure watching him she saw the crust of some old fear or dominant superstition melt under her eyes and was quite prepared when he remarked with what for him was a lightsome air i will buy the stuff if you will dare the darkness and intricacies of our old cellar i can give you no light you will have to feel your way according to my direction i am ready to dare anything he left her abruptly i will warn miss digby he called back she shall go with you as far as the cellar part five violet in her short career as an investigator of mysteries had been in many a situation calling for more than womanly nerve and courage but never or so it seemed to her at the time had she experienced a greater depression of spirit than when she stood with miss digby before a small door at the extreme end of the cellar and understood that here was her road a road which once entered she must take alone first it was such a small door no child older than eleven could possibly squeeze through it but she was of the size of a child of eleven and might possibly manage that difficulty secondly there are always some unforeseen possibilities in every situation and though she had listened carefully to mr van brooklyn's directions and was sure that she knew them by heart she wished she had kissed her father more tenderly in leaving him that night for the ball and that she had not pouted so undutifully at some harsh stricture he had made did this mean fear she despised the feeling if it did thirdly she hated darkness she knew this when she offered herself for this undertaking but she was in a bright room at the moment and only imagined what she must now face as a reality but one jet had been lit in the cellar and that near the entrance mr van brooklyn seemed not to need light even in his unfastening of the small door which violet was sure had been protected by more than one lock doubt shadow and a solitary climb between unknown walls with only a streak of light for her goal and the clinging pressure of florence digby's hand on her own for solace surely the prospect was one to tax the courage of her young heart to its limit but she had promised and she would fulfil so with a brave smile she stooped to the little door and in another moment had started on her journey for journey the shortest distance may seem 
when every inch means a heart throb, and one grows old in traversing a foot. At first the way was easy. She had but to crawl up a slight incline with the comforting consciousness that two people were within reach of her voice, almost within sound of her beating heart. But presently she came to a turn, beyond which her fingers failed to reach any wall on her left. Then came a step up which she stumbled, and farther on a short flight, each tread of which she had been told to test before she ventured to climb it, lest the decay of innumerable years should have weakened the wood too much to bear her weight. One, two, three, four, five steps, then a landing with an open space beyond. Half of her journey was done. Here she felt she could give a minute to drawing her breath naturally, if the air, unchanged in years, would allow her to do so. Besides, here she had been enjoined to do a certain thing, and to do it according to instructions. Three matches had been given her, and a little night candle. Denied all light up to now, it was at this point she was to light her candle and place it on the floor, so that in returning she should not miss the staircase and get a fall. She had promised to do this, and was only too happy to see a spark of light scintillate into life in the immeasurable darkness. She was now in a great room, long closed to the world, where once officers in colonial wars had feasted, and more than one council had been held. A room, too, which had seen more than one tragic happening, as its almost unparalleled isolation proclaimed. So much Mr. Van Brooklyn had told her, but she was warned to be careful in traversing it, and not upon any pretext to swerve aside from the right-hand wall till she came to a huge mantelpiece. This passed, and a sharp corner turned, she ought to see somewhere in the dim spaces before her a streak of vivid light shining through the crack at the bottom of the blocked-up door. The paper should be somewhere near this streak. All simple, all easy of accomplishment, if only that streak of light were all she was likely to see or think of. If the horror which was gripping her throat should not take shape if things would remain shrouded in impenetrable darkness and not force themselves in shadowy suggestion upon her excited fancy. But the blackness of the passageway through which she had just struggled was not to be found here. Whether it was the effect of that small flame flickering at the top of the staircase behind her, or of some change in her own powers of seeing, surely there was a difference in her present outlook. Tall shapes were becoming visible. The air was no longer blank. She could see. Then suddenly she saw why. In the wall, high up on her right, was a window. It was small and all but invisible, being covered on the outside with vines, and on the inside with the cobwebs of a century. But some small gleams from the starlight night came through, making phantasms out of ordinary things which unseen were horrible enough, and half seen, choked her heart with terror. I cannot bear it, she whispered to herself, even while creeping forward, her hand upon the wall. I will close my eyes, was her next thought. I will make my own darkness. And with a spasmodic forcing of her lids together, she continued to creep on, passing the mantelpiece, where she knocked against something which fell with an awful clatter. This sound, followed as it was by that of smothered voices from the excited group awaiting the result of her experiment from behind the impenetrable wall she should be nearing now, if she had followed her instructions aright, freed her instantly from her fancies, and opening her eyes once more she cast a look ahead, and to her delight saw but a few steps away the thin streak of bright light which marked the end of her journey. It took her but a moment after that to find the missing page, and picking it up in haste from the dusty floor, she turned herself quickly about and joyfully began to retrace her steps. Why, then, was it that in the course of a few minutes more her voice suddenly broke into a wild, unearthly shriek, which, ringing with terror, burst the bounds of that dungeon-like room, and sank a barbed shaft 
into the breasts of those awaiting the result of her doubtful adventure at either end of this dread no thoroughfare what had happened if they had thought to look out they would have seen that the moon held in check by a bank of cloud occupying half the heavens had suddenly burst its bounds and was sending long bars of revealing light into every uncurtained window end of the second part of missing page 13 by anna catherine green